this is Dr. Lawrence C. Scott, the president of Lawrence C. Scott and Associates, Inc., and uh, Professor Emeritus from LSU. Louisiana State University, and that's where you're at today down there. And uh, before we get into some other places across the country, let's start there in Louisiana. Uh, last time we spoke, you guys had a lot of uh, natural gas, I want to say, petrochemical projects in the pipeline. And did not much going on in the terms of fracking. Is that still the case down there? That's still the case. We're doing we're doing great in terms of going on downstream to the chemical industry. The chemical industry and the LNG export industry is just uh, exploding down here. Uh, to give you a little reference point, <clears throat> I've been watching the Louisiana economy for about 40 years, and a really good year in the past. If we had five billion dollars in industrial announcements, we'd have thought that was great. We've had about 170 billion. It's just it's just off the charts, big time down here. And of course, we have the pipeline infrastructure. We have access to natural gas, which is what these people want. And we have a very productive play in the northern part of the state called the Hainesville Shale. Uh, it's also a good source, plus the offshore in the Gulf of Mexico natural gas. So there's plenty of gas. There's plenty of ways to get to it. The price of natural gas is much higher in Europe uh, and in Asia. So the, the, the chemical companies are coming here to build their stuff. And LNG export companies are getting all prepped up. Some of them are already exporting. LNG uh, overseas. Is that one of the things that's going to actually help uh, the LNG, call it the natural gas market? I mean, over here in the States, I mean, in Texas, they're almost giving this stuff away for, th- for free. And, you know, it doesn't cost much to heat a home with natural gas up in the Bakken anymore. And you mentioned uh, uh, Europe. I think they're, what are they, 15, 18 bucks, something like that. And then you've got China, anywhere from like 7 to 10 or whatever. Is that what it's going to take, or is America going to have to start paying a few bucks more to get this, uh, you know, th- this industry booming again? Because right now it just well, seems like I mean, they're breaking I, even. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the LG people are not breaking even. Natural gas, and I really think that that problem is going to get solved uh, probably within the. And the reason for that is, the reason it is so cheap, they're flaring it off in Texas, it's basically a nuisance in Texas, where it's being produced as associated gas. I mean, they're really going after oil is what they're after. But their problem is, they don't have the dead gun pipeline capacity in the Permian Basin, and I think probably in your area as well, to get the natural gas to market. Matter of fact, they don't have enough, they don't have enough pipeline capacity to get the oil to market. But what is happening is, these are these are smart, clever, greedy capitalists in this industry, and they are reacting to the bottleneck. You're going to pipeline. These are being used by the or Mexico, which is a the place the big gas or it's going to be uh, refined into LNG and shipped abroad. Right now, low price in some cases being flared off is because there's just no way to get it out from where it is to the markets. Lauren Scott with us here. Uh, your phone kind of broke up there at the end there, so uh just wanted to... What, what would... Um, what would have to happen at the well site for some of that associated gas, that flaring gas, to get captured more? Would would there have to be a little bit more of a price increase on um, the natural gas side? Because at the end of the day, if those science projects can make money, the oil companies will do it. But they don't want to really risk it if they don't have a lot of extra dollars lying around. At least that's in my opinion. What would what would what do you think it would take for some of these science projects to start seeing more? Um, you know, time, I guess. Well, uh, if you're, I, I think the key, the key right now on the natural gas side is getting rid of the transportation bottleneck. There's just, there's just no way uh, to get the stuff, especially out of the problem. It's also a problem for you folks up in North Dakota about getting your stuff to the market in a timely way. And what is, what is happening is this driven down the price of natural gas. 
so much to where it's like I say it's being cleared off in some cases. And so the the key there is to is to get the pipeline infrastructure in place. And I think they're doing that. I think you're gonna see that I think you'll see that problem go away. And this is not new this issue. I mean when you guys first started producing natural uh, oil up in up in the Bakken play, the problem was you were bringing it down to Cushing and it started stacking up in Cushing, Oklahoma, because there's no way to get it from Cushing and the refineries on the Gulf Coast. Again, there was a pipeline problem, and it took about a year and a half for them to reverse some pipelines, to build some new pipelines, to get rid of the bottleneck. And so I, I just think the, it's, it's, the market's just lagging a little bit. In this case, it's the pipeline market that is uh, lagging a little bit behind, and I think they're going to take care of that problem the next year, year and a half. Well, I, I think you're right on that. In fact, that was my next question was um, some of these uh, uh, bottlenecks, if you will. It just seems like there's a, there's a lot heading to Corpus Christi, and there's going to be quite a bit heading to Cushing, like you said. Um, mm-hmm. uh, who knows what's going to happen with the Keystone now that the some of the judges are trying to block it in different courts, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, yeah. what, 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 include now the export because we're exporting it. What's that going to mean in 2019, or two, let's call it 2020, when they're done building these pipelines? What's the world going to look like in the world of energy? Because we're going to have quite a bit of uh, transportation for natural gas and, uh, and and crude oil as well. Yeah, well, I think, I think 2019 is going to be a whole lot better for the people who are actually drilling for oil and gas. Because right now, uh, in, in certain areas of the country, uh, you're, especially the Permian Basin in West Texas, but also for you folks up in the Bakken area, your your product is being sold at a discount to the world price and to the, the actually the U.S. price because of these bottlenecks. And I think once the pipelines are removed, you're going to see those discounts uh, go away. You're going to start seeing your price move up to more par with the world price. And I think that's going to be good. And I think, you know, uh, there's going to be plenty of demand because you have uh, – not only some more trains being added to LNG export facilities down here, a train is uh, a, a word that is used to describe the series of machines that natural gas goes through for, to, to take it from a gas to a liquid form where it can then be put on an LNG export uh, ship and take taken to Europe or Asia or someplace like that where it can be regasified and put in the system. But but you you have you have not only a number of LNG projects that will be coming on board over the next three, two to three years, but you also have down in Mexico, they are taking a place where they were mainly generating their electricity with coal and fuel oil. They are now building new pipelines all over the place to bring natural gas down there, start generating their electricity with natural gas. So that also is creating a whole new market for natural gas we have not had before and then of course uh the the movement uh away from generating electricity with coal towards the cheaper natural gas still continues in the united states in a very big way and so that's uh, that's a third area that's generating a significant demand for natural gas so i think once we get past this bottleneck issue with the pipelines i think the market for natural gas looks pretty good going forward yeah, you just named a few good indicators that there the, the the market's ready. We just got to get the transportation in place or the distribution. That's just kind of the age old business one hundred and one. You know, if the market's there, you still got to get the product to the people. So, um, right. And the good news, the good news is a lot of this natural gas. Well, the, well, the problems are uh, uh, is in is in West Texas. I mean, it's it's also where you are, but it's also in West Texas. And in West Texas, in Texas in general. There's not a fear of pipelines that exist in some of the areas of the country. I mean, we have enough miles of pipelines, for example, in Louisiana to circle the globe for about four times. So we, we've been around pipelines our whole lives. We're not afraid of them, and we're not concerned about them. And that, the same thing is true in Texas. There's not, a, there's not a fear of pipelines. Now, it's a little bit more of an issue when we get up in the Bakken play and trying to move uh, stuff from your area down to where it's needed down here in the southern part of the United States because you're going across areas where people are not used to pipelines and are fearful of them and I think unjustifiably fearful of them. So that that may slow down things a bit on your area, but I don't think it's going to slow down things in Texas in the Permian Basin. 
Lauren Scott, Lauren Scott and Associates. Um, 2018, I'm kind of asking some people, uh, you know, kind of taking a look at that year. Um, did you see any themes stick out? If you were to call 2018 the year of XYZ, uh, anything that kind of stands out in terms of uh, repetition or maybe something hugely symbolic that happened? Is just, um, you know, one of those year end type of uh, interviews. What would you name 2018 as? Well, I think it's been uh, the the year of the roller coaster ride huh. on prices. I mean, that's the thing that, that this industry always has to struggle with. Again, I've been watching this industry for four decades now, and it, it, it's it's you just never know what's coming next. And so we started out with a period when we were the oil prices were growing and steadily going up and steadily going up, and then we hit this last month or so where the prices have not only drop but they've dropped a lot you know you're talking about going from the 70s the lower 70s down to uh, now under 50 and that's that's quite a drop uh and so i think i think the industry having to deal with this roller coaster of prices has really been has really been the thing that's been difficult and has really marked the year now it's also been a year in which, which has been marked by a whole lot more oil being exported uh, than ever before in our country's history. And uh, that's that's been interesting to watch. It's been interesting to watch how the market has started to figure out ways to get some of this crude oil uh, into the international market. Uh, because when you, when you first of all, you got to get it from where you are in the Bakken or where you are in West Texas down to the coast where it can be put on large tankers and, uh, and then exported. And then the tricky thing, once you get to the coast, how do you get it on large tankers? Because most of the ports in the United States, with the exception of one, and that's the Louisiana offshore oil port, uh, cannot handle very large crude carriers, the VLCCs, which is the way you want to ship oil in the, in the, in the, in the cheapest way. And so they've been trying to, they've been trying to figure out ways to, deep draft their, their, their ports. They've been doing what is called lightering. That is, they'll park the, the very large crude carrier off of the Gulf, and then they'll use smaller ships to take oil off and then put it on the very large crude carrier, which is not the most efficient way to do it. But it's been an unusual year, and, uh, and the big question now is where are prices going next? I think that's the thing on everybody's mind. Kind of wrapping up here, um, just a question. Uh, Quick sidebar, uh, are you still speaking? I know you're doing forecasting, that sort of thing. Are you still going around to the different shale plays and educating some folks? Still doing that. I, I haven't been up in the Bakken in, in about two years, uh, which I missed. There were really great people up there. That was always fun to go up in that area. But I'm still going around the country and, and talking about what's going on in the oil and gas industry. That's something that's very much on uh, everybody's mind. It's a uh, it's something that that if, if impacts everybody from their transportation costs to their heating costs in their homes to jobs in many particular areas of the country. So it's uh, it's been fun, and people are very interested in what's going on in this industry. I can promise you that. You know, one of the things, just a quick sidebar, and then I'll we'll wrap up. But um, in North Dakota, for example, they've got one of the highest. Uh, oil and gas taxes, uh, about 10, 11% when you combine the uh, production and extraction or something like that. There's two, two taxes, you put them together, it's 10, 11%. And um, so they pay quite a bit of taxes. And there's a lot of different uh, revenue that comes in from the oil and gas industry, yada, yada. They've got an east versus west thing, all the money goes into the state, and then they divvy it up afterwards. So the oil and gas communities kind of get left out in the dust quite a bit. And um, Sometime, I'd love to just see your economic mind wrap around if they're already paying 10, 11% tax to the state, and then they're turning around and donating a million dollars to the hospital and to the schools. You know what I mean? They, they really donate between taxes and charitable donations quite a bit to local communities that goes unreported because of all those taxes they already pay. Do you know what I mean by yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's no question about it. Matter of fact, I, I recently conducted an economic impact study of the uh, the energy industry on the Louisiana economy. And, uh, you know, you, you, now in Louisiana, our severance tax on oil is 12.5%. Uh, 
So you, you ask yourself, what industry, what other industry in the United States takes us to pay 12.5% off the top of their revenues, not profits? They can be losing money. They still have to pay 12.5% of revenue before they even you know, before they even get to lift a barrel of oil. I mean, after they've lifted a barrel of oil, before they even start looking at their other expenses. There's very few industries like that. The only one I can think of now is the casino industry, maybe like that. But but no other industry has to do that. But then, in addition to that, once they pay the service tax, they have to pay income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, all these other taxes as well. It is a it is a it is a rich rich environment for the local and state treasuries in any state with this industry operates. <laughs> That's a great way to phrase it. <laughs> so uh, just kind of wrap it up a little bit. Anything that uh, as we talk about wrapping up 2018 and uh, looking ahead, of course, to 2019 speculation is always dangerous in the oil and gas industry, quickly to say that. But uh, anything that we might have forgot, anything you want to reiterate, anything that you want to make sure is mentioned uh, as we kind of conclude? Well, I think the only thing is, and that the big question everybody has that's in the industry now is, where's the price of oil going now? And, I mean, I, my position, and, 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 and I'll tell you, you shouldn't listen to anything I have to say because my, I think everybody's record on forecasting oil price is horrible. It's just, it is just, I think it's, I taught forecasting for 40 years, for 30 years at LSU to MBAs and executive MBAs. And this is, to my mind, the second most difficult thing in the economy to forecast is oil prices. I really think that oil prices are going to ultimately go back up into the 70s. And the reason for that is because the Saudis and the Russians are just losing too much money at these prices. And I think what they will do is they've already agreed as a result of the December 6th meeting to start reducing their output. And I think they will start taking enough oil off the market to reverse this trend and get the prices back up to 70. They are very much incentivized to do this uh, because of what's happening to their treasury. Uh, the, the demand for oil, the nature, we, we learned this in principles of economics, the demand for oil is very inelastic. And when that, what that means is when you get the price up, your, by cutting out, but your revenues actually go up. They don't go down, they go up. And I think they know that, and I think they're going to take the measures to take oil off the market and get the price up around 70. 